It's so good to be here this morning to sing the praises of our God. Let's stand together. Let's sing this morning. The whole earth is filled with the glory of God, and we can see it in everything. Lord, um, let's, uh, as, we, as we come before you, Lord, this morning, I just, um, I just ask that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word. Um, Lord, I just ask that as we, as we sing your praises, your, your Holy Spirit would, would lead us and guide us. And um, Lord, we just thank you so much that um, we are able to gather together as believers this morning and um, to lift up our voices before you. Um, Lord, we just give you all the honor, all the glory. And Lord, we are so grateful that we have been set free from our sin, that we have been ransomed. Lord, you sent your son as a sacrifice to die in our place. And Lord, for that, we are so grateful. But Lord, even beyond that, we're so grateful for who you are. Lord, we just praise you because simply you are worthy of our praise. You don't have to do anything to earn our praise, but you are worthy of it. Lord, we thank you for that. In my heart, in my heart, there's a fire burning, a passion deep within my soul, not slowing down, not growing cold. An unquenchable flame that keeps burning brighter, a love that's blazing like the sun, for who you are and what you've done. And as the fire is raging on, so your praise becomes my song. The whole earth is filled with your glory, Lord. Angels and men adore, creation longs for what's in store. May you be honored and glorified, exalted and lifted high. Here at your feet I live. far and wide through history you reign on high from the depths of the sea to the mountain summit the power Lord it knows no bounds a higher love cannot be found so let
Please be seated. Well, we're glad each and every one of you are here today, and we're thankful for those who've tuned in online as well. And uh, we're just glad we can gather together in person or out there watching. And so as we gather together, we want to experience God's presence in our lives. And Psalm 34, 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And that's our purpose, and that's our focus today is to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. Well, it's exciting to know the snow's melting. We're just 20 some days away from spring. The sun's been out. And so we got a lot to be thankful for and to hope for coming up as we uh, transition seasons. And uh, we're glad that everyone is gathered today. And I encourage you, if you're here in the sanctuary, take a moment, open your program. On the right-hand side, you'll see the little tear-off section. And uh, if you would put your name on there and flip it over, any prayer requests, drop those in the boxes out in the lobby after the service. That would be awesome. If you're online, we encourage you. We see every week more people are subscribing. And uh, we encourage you to hit that subscribe button on YouTube. And uh, you can also go to our website, pleasantviewbett.com, and look for the About Us tab in the drop-down box. Take the next step. You can fill out some information and let us know that you're watching. And any prayer requests, you can submit that way, and we could be praying for you. Well, a few announcements. We have church membership coming up. We, have, we didn't even offer this last year because of COVID, but church membership class uh, is available for anyone who wants to become a member of our church on March 23rd. I believe that's a Tuesday night from 6 to 9 p.m. And uh, so let me know if you might be interested in becoming a member of the church. Uh, we have at least one person who wants to be baptized on Easter Sunday. We're going to have a baptism. And so uh, be praying by any kids, any adults, anybody in here or anybody um, that, that isn't here. Or maybe you're online. You'd like to join us for baptism. That's always a special day when we do that on Easter Sunday. Let us know so we can meet with you and uh, get you prepared for that. Uh, Carrie Barfels wants to thank everybody for their participation in the uh, thank you notes for our medical workers, I had lunch with Jason Crosby, station manager at WDLM on Friday, and he said they're gonna exceed their goal more like 2,200 instead of 2,000. And our church exceeded our goal of 200. We have 215 cards. So thank you for all the effort put into that. Some of you made cards. Some of you made some amazing looking cards. I saw those. And uh, some did, you know, took the time to fill them in. So we wanna thank you for that. And uh, we'll look forward to blessing those people in the next week or so as those go out to them. There's also a form in your program if you want to order Easter lily in memory of someone. And the orders are due on March the 17th. And then this coming Friday and Saturday is a women's event, IF. It's a gathering of the women. And uh, we're going to show a video in just a moment about that. But the information's in the program. You could gather here at the church if you let Carrie know uh, on Friday night and Saturday. You can watch it at home. You can watch home Friday, come Saturday, whatever you want. But if you're, you're planning to do that, um, she needs to send you a, a code to register free online if you want to do it at home or gather here. And so the information's there. And uh, we just want to encourage our women. It's an opportunity that you haven't had much this year to uh, gather together and just uh, meet. And of course, you can spread out here as you watch it. So let's watch this short video about the IF gathering. Again, if you want more information, contact the church office and we'll get that information to you. Some of you are doing this at his finished devotional book through the season of Lent. I find it's very good. We get to read, 
you get the journal as well. And on Sunday, they take a break from all that. But today is the second Sunday in Lent, and it says in Romans 6, 4, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And it says, think of an element that binds two things together, glue, Velcro fasteners, a tight knot, nails. More closely than such items, we are bound to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We are so intimately connected that when he died, we died with him. And when he was raised from the dead, we also were raised to newness of life. So as we go through this Lent season, let us be reminded of the promises of God's word, not just the cross, and that's very important as well, but the resurrection of Christ as well. At this time, we're going to pray for our offering this week. And again, we have four modes of giving. You can give out here in the boxes, as some of you already have this morning. You can give online through our app and our website. You can mail it in, and you can even drop it off physically here to our church. And so we're just continually grateful for the giving, the faithful giving of our people. And let's pray today and just commit the offering this week to the Lord. Father, giving of our monies, Lord, is an act of worship, and we pray that you will take the money that's been given, Lord, and just continue to help us to be wise stewards of it, especially as we gather next Sunday to consider, as a finance team, the budget, and then devote on that the end of March as a church family. Lord, we do all that by faith, and we just thank you for the people that vote, but then support it by their generous giving and their faithful giving. And so, Lord, we, we don't take it for granted. But we know ultimately the money is given in the name of the Lord, given to you. And so, Lord, as we think of the opportunities to have ministries like the women gathering or just to have an opportunity for the men to be online on Thursday nights or even to gather here in worship or youth group in Awana, Lord, all those things take money to accomplish. And we thank you for the gifts that have been given. Thank you for our missionaries around the world as well. Thank you for the opportunity to continue to spread the gospel through them. And Lord, my heart breaks today as I think of that 14-year-old boy, Jamon Winfrey, Lord, as he lost his life on this week, Wednesday, Thursday. We pray you continue to be with that grieving family and, and the grieving neighborhood, Lord, as they were shocked by the details of that crime. And we pray you'll minister and that you will work in a powerful way that somehow you will bring glory to yourself through those events. And we think of Ian Fink today. We pray for him as he uh, goes for a biopsy this week, that you will just give him peace, give his family peace, and we pray for uh, the healing of whatever it is that he's dealing with. And so, Lord, we just uh, thank you, and we love you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're privileged today to have Donna McCauley. You probably saw her up here. She was singing, and uh, they came into town uh, this weekend to be with us. A group met over at Grandview on Friday night to get an update. Uh, we're part of uh, a group of four converged churches here in the Quad Cities. In July, for our four churches to give $83,000 over two years. And I'm glad to report to you that this year, 2,115 churches have already been planted. And the giving has been uh, 50, I think it's $56,000 has already been given toward the $83,000 dollar goal. So we just have $27,000 among our four churches to finish by July of 2022, so we're well on our way. But we're just uh, grateful that Donna's here. She's going to come and give us an update about their ministry with TTI as they're now based in Raleigh, North Carolina. Let's give Donna a welcome as she comes. Good morning. It is really good to be home, <laughs> um, even though you have snow. <laughs> I think in baseball, I'm called the pinch hitter today. Normally, you would have seen Dale. The key with the pinch hitter is you never know what you're going to get, <laughs> right? I could totally strike out, or I could hit the ball over the fence and make a home run. So we're going we're gonna to shoot for the home run this morning. Um, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, not part of your ways, not a sliver of your ways, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. 
I have to say that exactly a year ago, I was leaning very hard on that verse. Um, God, you're sure you want me to leave my job? God, are you sure we're supposed to move to Raleigh? My three of my four kids live here. Ten of my grandchildren are here. Are you sure, Lord? Okay, that's what you want us to do. That's what we will do. So the house was sold, and it was exactly a month ago tomorrow that was my final day at Green Chevrolet, and we moved in the front end of this pandemic. Ha! <laughs> Let me tell you, were there extra challenges because of it? Absolutely. <laughs> but all is good. And um, I am enjoying the Raleigh weather, but I will tell you, I've sent Pastor Ed an email not too long ago that said, Pleasant View, you need to appreciate what you have in this church body. You need to be grateful. You need to thank the Lord, and you need to uplift your pastor because he does a wonderful job in this place. And as I have been searching for a church home and have been unsuccessful so far, um, it has made me yearn to be with you more, um, more and more. So you just need to know that, um, and just don't take it for granted, because you know that old adage song, you don't know what you got till it's gone? It's true. Um, so when we left here, I was supposed to be the admis administrative assistant to David Nelms. I wasn't too sure about that job, but okay. If that's what you want me to do, Lord, I will do it. We got to Raleigh, and they figured out in the meantime that they needed help in the finance department. And what did Donna do here? She ran the accounting office. So it was ding, ding, ding. Oh, Lord, you are so good. Look what you've done. You opened that door right up for me, and I didn't even know it was going to happen. Um, and that happened almost within a week after we moved. So there have been a lot of moving parts and a lot of changes in our lives. Um, but the one thing that is solid is that Jesus never fails, ever. During COVID, yes, TTI slowed down, but not very much. <laughs> yes, the world closed down, but many of the countries opened much faster than America has opened, and most of them, especially... Um, India is going again. Um, Africa is exploding right now. The opportunities in Africa are exploding. And most of you that know us personally, that's where Dale's heart is in West Africa. Um, but nevertheless, there is a, tons of things going on, so much that it's impossible to share it all. Miramar went through a military coup three weeks ago, and we lost all contact with Miramar. Um, they were shut down. They lost their internet. They lost everything. And we had a glimmer of hope this week where we are back in contact with them. So God is good. He is sustaining. Um, and in 2021, already, we're seeing things accelerate. So what I will say to you in my heart, what all this means, with all that we've gone through as a country, as this pandemic has gone across the world, I believe that Jesus is setting the stage. So my question to you, are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus to come back? Because it is, I believe, going to be in my lifetime for sure. I want to just say that TTI, as they are just exploding, which what that means is planting churches, planting churches with indigenous people, for those that you do, who do not know who TTI is, and those churches are always accountable, and they are always encouraged, but they share their story. I basically shared with you just a few minutes ago my current story. How often do you share your story with someone else? of where you're at, where God brought you, and what God is doing. Just a thought. So, um, this pinch hitter is going to turn things over to a video that we recently um, got up and running. And uh, Banu is going to put that on. And it's just kind of a glimpse into TTI.
there's a worldwide phenomenon happening. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It happens quietly, beyond the notice of any news organization and with even less fanfare. Every 40 minutes, in some village, under some tree, in someone's hut, a new TTI church starts. Every 40 minutes. In the time you take for a lunch break, in the time it takes to watch your favorite show, in the time of most Sunday sermons, a new church is birthed. Every 40 minutes, around the clock, all year long. While you sleep, it happens. While you eat dinner with your family, it happens. While kids go to school and adults go to work, it happens happens. It happens so quietly, it's seemingly out of thin air. But you and I know better. Churches don't form out of thin air, but rather by the wind of the Holy Spirit. Through prayer and sacrifice and faithful disciples who do whatever it takes to get the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth. It's a worldwide phenomenon, and you can be a part. Please stand again with us and join us in singing.
lips, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. the 
time for our kids to make their way downstairs for Children's Church and encourage you to take out your copy of God's Word, the Bible, turn over to Genesis chapter 31, Genesis chapter 31, if you would, and uh, we're going to continue on as we talk about the cycles of dysfunction in uh, the life of Jacob. Thank you. As we get started today, I'm just really passionate about this particular study because if people can grasp and understand what God is trying to teach us through the lives of the, of the people who have gone before us and avoid the heartaches and the consequences, then it will be worth it all for generations, not just for your life, but also for the lives that you impact we could celebrate the, the positive things. I think about all the good things my parents instilled into me, a work ethic and lots and lots of things. But also we have to evaluate how we were raised and how the bad things that we've picked up are passed on to the next generation and then do something about that. And then we see that even to the next generation, to our grandkids. So we're going to talk about the, the deceiver Jacob, part two today. In Genesis chapter 31, beginning with verse 1. Now Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what was our father's he has gained all his wealth. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his flock was, in verse 5, and he said to them, I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not permit him to harm me. If he said, the spotted shall be your wages, then all the flock bore spotted. And if he said, the striped shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. Skip down to verse 14 of that same chapter, verse 14. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to Jacob, Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he sold us and he has indeed devoured our money. All the wealth that God has taken away from my father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, whatever God has said to you do. So Jacob arose and set his sons and his wives on camels. He drove, drove away all his livestock and all his property that he had gained, the livestock and his possession that he had acquired at Padam Aram, to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. And may God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. So you, you know this very famous story about the Trojan horse, but you may not know the backstory of it. There was a guy... Heinrich Schleiman in 1871, who was a very wealthy uh, businessman. And all of his life, since he was young, he wanted to go and excavate and dig up the city of Troy. And uh, as he retired, he got the opportunity to go to Turkey. And apparently you can go there now, you can see the ruins. The walls are 16 feet thick. The towers and other things are there for you to see. But if you remember the story in the Iliad that Homer wrote, it was about how the, the Greek army sieged this city for 10 years, and they were unable to break through the wall and to conquer these people. And so even Achilles, their favorite famous warrior, died, and they were about ready to give up and go home. And so the Greek king, Odysseus, came up with this idea, and he built this huge wooden horse. I'm sure you've seen or heard the story and seen uh, replicas of the picture of what it must have been like. And, of course, they hid the Greek soldiers inside. And then they rolled it up to the, or brought it up to the gate of the city. And then the Greek army got in their boats and retreated out of sight. And the people inside the city of Troy thought, wow, they must have given up and they left us a gift. And, of course, they opened the gates and brought in the horse. And as you know, the story is at nighttime while everyone was sleeping. The soldiers come out, open the city gates, the ships come back. And the Greek soldiers come, and they ransack the city. And by the time the people of Troy woke up in the morning, their city was under siege and being burned. And, of course, they ran and tried to escape, and they were all killed. And we see there in, a, in that story 
what happens to deception and manipulation, they lost everything. They lost their city. They lost their, their lives, many of them. They lost their wealth and their resources. The consequences of deception, trickery, and lies. Well, we have to be constantly discerning about people lying to us and deceiving and manipulating us. Jacob and Laban, they were two peas in the same pod. Both were battling for who could outdo one another in the area of deception, lying, and manipulation. Jacob and Laban uh, came together, and in the end, they both ended up losing. Jacob moves the daughters of Laban away, to, back to his homeland, away from Laban. And there's bitterness in the end between Laban and Jacob. And the daughters most likely lost their inheritance, as we read. So let's review for a moment last week's message and how it sets us up for today's message. You have these in your notes. Jacob's dream, a response of worship. And remember, he was on his way to Badam Aran. Uh, he was leaving because his mom, Rebecca, said, go up to Uncle Laban. Esau wants to kill you as soon as your father Isaac dies. Go find a wife up there and live in safety. And of course, on the road, he goes to Luz, which later becomes Bethel, Bethel, house of God. He sleeps on a rock, wakes, and while he's sleeping, a dream occurs, and he sees God above a ladder and angels ascending and descending up and down the ladder. And he has an experience, a direct experience with God. Then we talked about how Jacob was deceived how he thought he was working for Rachel and on the wedding night. And the next morning, he realizes that he married Leah first, and they had to work another seven years to get Rachel's hand in marriage. And so the deceiver was tricked by Laban. Well, let's now move to today's message, and we see Jacob's deception, his deception. We see this back and forth with Laban and Jacob. Now Jacob's deception escaped to go home. Jacob swindles Laban. Jacob says that Laban was not appreciative of God's blessing, the flocks of Laban through Jacob, as he used to be. There was a lot of griping and complaining and upset about uh, how successful Jacob was, and so there was this uh, pride and competition and rivalry. Then God came to Jacob and said, it's time to go home. So Jacob recounts how God had blessed him and provided for Laban through his personal care of Laban's flocks. Look at verse 29 of Genesis 30. Jacob said to him, you yourself know how I served you, speaking to Laban, and how your livestock has fared with me. For you had little before I came and has increased abundantly. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when I shall provide for my own household also, he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you. Everyone that's not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. Laban said, good. Let it be as you have said. But notice what Laban really did in verse 35. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it, and every lamb that was black, and put them in charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. He agreed to terms, and then he broke his word. And then he separated himself by such a great distance that by the time Jacob figured it out, it was going to be hard to go back and retrieve what was his. We go on to read in that chapter, verses 37 through 43. So what did Jacob do? He says, all right, well, you did that to me. Here's what I'm going to do. So he takes these almond tree sticks and he peels them back and reveals the white part of it and puts it in front of the feeding trough. And as the animals came and looked at that white stuff, which is interesting, to play on words because Laban means white. So he outplayed whitey. He played these white branches in front of these animals and they began to reproduce and were stronger and multiplied more than the, the ones that Laban had taken away. He had been swindled and lied to by Laban with the changing of his wages 10 times, as it says in chapter 32 and verse 7. And then 
The, the wives, they felt unsupported by their dad. They felt their dad had mistreated them. They sensed they weren't going to get an inheritance. So they agreed with Jacob, load up their belongings, and began to travel and head for Jacob's home without saying goodbye to Laban. He was at the busiest time of the season, Laban was, shearing the sheep that, to get the wool to take to the market. So we see as they leave, Jacob steals Laban's gods. Jacob steals Laban's gods. In Genesis 31, verse 30, and now you've gone away. Laban, as, as the story goes, before we read that, we know that Laban finds out that his family is leaving. Jacob and, and the, the, the two daughters are gone. And so he catches up to him. He also finds out that his gods are stolen. And this is the confrontation of verse 30. And now you've gone away because you long greatly for your father's house, Jacob. But why did you steal my gods? And Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid, for I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. Anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of your kinsmen, point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now, Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Rachel now enters in in the deception and the manipulation, just like her husband and her dad. One lie breeds another, breeds another, breeds another until it's exhausting. I can remember I struggled as a a young kid with lying. And I can remember nights laying in bed, looking at the ceiling, thinking about, okay, how was I going to use the next lie to cover up the previous lie so they wouldn't figure out that the third lie was actually a lie. And pretty soon your parents figure it out. You can't come up with enough lies and stories to match up, right? And so imagine what this all is breeding in their lives. In Genesis 31, so Laban, verse 33, went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two female servants, but he didn't find his gods. And he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. And Laban felt all about the tent, but he did not find them. And she said to her father, Let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the way of a woman is upon me. So he searched, but he did not find the household gods. She put him in the saddle of the animal and was sitting on it. And because it was her time of the month, he respected that and did not let her come down off the the camel, I believe it was, and then to look into there. So deception and theft precipitated Jacob leaving Canaan to go back to go to Laban. You know, as his mom said, you got to go because you deceived your brother out of birthright and blessing. It's interesting that Jacob had stolen his brother's blessing and inheritance and now deceived Isaac. Now he's doing the same to Laban as he heads back to Canaan. So our cycles and our habits of dysfunction and sin come so naturally to us because it's ingrained in us. It's our default position in many ways. And one of the ways in which we suffer the consequences of our behavior is by passing those bad habits on to our children. So rather than me give you a great illustration by words, I thought we'd just take a a moment and listen to this song. Many of you know this song, Cats in the Cradle by Harry Chapman. But I encourage you to listen to the words, maybe in a new and fresh way, and think about the effects of a dad on a son. Let's watch this together. Child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way, but there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away, and he was talking before I knew it. And as he grew, he'd say, I'm gonna be like you, Dad. You know I'm gonna be like you. And the cats in the cradle and the silver stone, little boy blue and the man in the moon. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today. I got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. And it walked away, but his smile never dimmed. It said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, you know I'm going to be like him. And 
the cats in the cradle and a silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when. But we'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. Well, he came from college just the other day. So much like a man I just had to say. Son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and he said with a smile, What I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later, can I have them, please? And the cat's in the cradle and a silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you're coming home, son, I don't know when. We'll get together then, Dad. You know we'll have a good time then. Since retired, my son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle and the kids have the flu. But it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been sure nice talking to you. And as he hung up the phone, it occurred to me He'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. At the cats in the cradle and a silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, son, I don't know when. But we'll get together then, Dad. You know we'll have a good time then. sink into your heart and life and especially those of your dads and moms and granddads and grandmoms to think about you know what are you building into the lives of those that are coming behind you the application here is that old habits die very slowly so we kind of picked that up in the song the intention was there right but it never changed it never happened old habits die very slowly they can cause a lot of damage and a lot of heartache if we allow those habits to continue. But then we see the transformation of his heart and Jacob's deformity. Jacob's deformity. And sometimes when we go through suffering, sometimes when we face the stark reality of what's going on in our life and, and we realize the, the, the habits of sin and its effect, we come to the end of ourselves. And Jacob, this is the moment that he comes to the end of himself and really, really understands the depth of the experience of having a relationship with God. It says in Genesis 32, I encourage you to turn over there, Genesis 32, verses 22 and 23. Genesis 32, 22. It says, the same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. And he took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. Long story short, Laban comes, as we said, and he confronts and Jacob and his two daughters. And as Jacob or Laban challenges Jacob, Jacob explains that despite Laban's deception, manipulation of him, God has blessed Laban. And it takes us back to that promise in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3 about the Jewish people. It says, God says, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Because God had his hand on Jacob, who had, in this story, become Israel. He blessed Laban through him. Jacob had paid his dues for 20 years, and he and Laban agreed that God had protected and prospered Jacob during that time. And so in their final meeting, Laban and Jacob set up memorial stones as a reminder for both of them, Laban asked Jacob to take care of his daughters, Rachel and Leah, and treat them well with respect and dignity. He also asked that he not marry and have any more wives other than Rachel and Leah. Laban goes home, 
Jacob moves on. But now he has to deal with his brother Esau, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But the next thing we see here is Jacob scuffles with God over control of his life. He's still battling. Now he's got to go to back home. Now he's got to face Esau, who he's cheated out of his birthright and his blessing. Jacob scuffles with God, and as he's wrestling with this in his mind, in Genesis 32, verse 24, and Jacob was left alone, and a man, the angel of the Lord, wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, the angel touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out, pulled out a joint, and he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. This could have very well been the appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ, the Christophany, of him coming and putting on the form of an angel and wrestling with Jacob. This was a spiritual battle, maybe not a physical one, we're not sure, but we know it's probably spiritual because obviously the angel of the Lord could have easily overpowered Jacob if it was a physical battle. But this was a struggle for Jacob to give up his deceptive ways and his self-sufficient attitude. Here's the question, how have you wrestled with God over the years in your life for control of your life to be self-sufficient, to say, God, this is what I want to do now. I want you to bless it. Have you been in those places? And when I've wrestled with God, you know what I found out? You know, when you box with God, you find out your arms are too short. You know, you can't outbox God. You can't out-wrestle him. And so the best thing to do, especially early in life, is come to a place of surrender of giving over these things. Jacob was on the threshold of the promised land as he wrestled with the angel of the Lord. The darkness of that all-night battle may have symbolized Jacob's fear and uncertainty about the future, as I said, about to see Esau, his brother, after many years, about to go into back home and face the music of the relatives of what happened in the past. Do you ever get the sick feeling you get when you've been found out about telling lies? You know, you ever have someone come and say and ask you the question, is this really the truth? You ever felt the, the tinge of conviction when somebody asks you a question like that? Can you imagine what must have been going on in Jacob's life as he was going to have to face Esau and face the music? And we see it every day in our political world, right? You'll see a politician say one thing a year or two before and they get it on videotape and then two years later they'll say something else And even though he's confronted with the tape, he'll say he never said it at all. And isn't that the way it is with our world and our culture around us? Well, we see finally here that Jacob surrenders his independent spirit to God. He surrenders. He comes to the end of himself. He realizes that he's not smart enough. He's not big enough. He can't handle all the situations. Lying and manipulating is not going to be the answer. Look at verse 27 of Genesis 32. And he said to him, what is your name? The angel he was wrestling with. And he said, Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you've striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that's on the hip socket because the angel touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Notice he was given a new name, Israel. A name change signifies a character change. Israel means God fighter. You will fight for God. Jacob had been trying to do all this life to get God's blessing his way. But now he yields his life to God and allows God to bless him and all of Israel in God's timing and God's way. So Jacob names the place Peniel to commemorate this event. In chapter 32, verse 30, it says, So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. You remember in the Pentateuch it said that if you... God said, if you were to see my face, you would die immediately. Well, this is a rare opportunity that Jacob had. And we know that the apostles got to see the glory of the Lord face to face. In John 1, 18, it says, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, but now he has made him known. And Jacob had the special privilege 
of being able to see the angel of the Lord, probably Christ, face to face. Well, God symbolizes Jacob's emotional deformity of all of his self-sufficiency, his pride, his stubbornness, his self-confidence, and he left them with a reminder of a physical deformity by shriveling up this tendon in his body. The Jewish scholars say it was one of the tendons or sinews in his hip or groin area that was affected that caused Jacob to limp. Some commentators think that he limped the rest of his life, and there's some that believe that over time he was healed from it. But nevertheless, it was a visible reminder of the transformation that went on in the heart of Jacob. And so we know that even today, if I'm correct, some of you are in Torah club, you can correct me on this, but I think the Jews do not eat a part of this um, uh, animal's uh, there because of this. It says in verse 32, therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket because the angel touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Jacob's life was spared, but he was left with a physical reminder of, of his deformity. As I said, not just physical, but the inner emotion. Jacob's prayer for deliverance was answered by God, encountering him face to face. His flesh failed him as he wrestled with God. He became crippled out of his natural strength, but soon became bold by trusting in God's strength alone. And Israel's ultimate victory would come not by the usual ways by which nations gain power, but through the power of divine blessing as they sought to please God. So it is that victory comes in our lives, not by our will or by our strength, but by the laying down and the giving of ourselves and putting aside our weaknesses. It says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And you think about the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 5 through 10. He had this thorn in the flesh. And I think God wisely didn't define what that was because we could all fill in the blank as to what is our thorn in the flesh. Paul said three times he prayed for God to take this thorn in the flesh. Some believe it was epilepsy. Others say it might have been uh, eye problems because later on he would have to have someone write his letters. We don't know. He prayed three times for God to heal, but guess what? God didn't heal because he wanted to keep Paul humble and dependent upon God. And he says, your grace is sufficient. And he says, when I am weak, you are strong. And that's the place where we need to come where we're fully dependent upon God, surrounding our talents our abilities, our spiritual gifts, and letting God use them in his time and his way for his purpose. So our application here is that our dependency upon God and not ourselves overcomes the world, overcomes the cycles of dysfunction, overcomes uh, the emotional things in our life that we need to break the ties from the past, that drag us down, that cause us to uh, spew out anger in our relationships that cause us to be defensive about things. And we could go on and on as to what those cycles of dysfunction look like. Unfortunately, those have been abused either verbally, physically, or sexually. If they don't really get the help, they often repeat those things to the next generation. And God says, and we'll see in the story of Joseph, how Joseph unpacks the baggage of all these dysfunctions that were passed to him and gets victory over them. And so we can have victory as well. So our dependency on God and not ourselves overcomes the world. So quickly here, here's some biblical ways to deal with breaking the emotional chains of habitual sin. We talked about the behavior, the outward last week. Now we're gonna talk about the inward and what you can do in your life to help break these things so that you don't act out upon these uh, habitual sins. Number one, we have to come to the place where we are sick and tired of being sick and tired. We got to come to the place where we're just tired of repeating over and over and over and giving in, of saying something damaging to one of our relatives or uh, getting overly angry with our kids or whatever it may be. We have to come to the place where we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. In Proverbs 26, 11, it says, like a dog that returns to his vomit, a fool repeats his folly. When I was growing up, my mom, she loved to have Boston Terriers. We lived in Pittsburgh, and every time one would die, we'd get another one. I think we had three over the course of the time that I was at home. And, uh, but it was very interesting, because when that dog would get sick, 
and throw up. Guess what the dog did? And we'd have to go and pull the dog away from it, right? And so at some point, you have to get sick and tired of doing that, of going back to those things. Number two, we have to admit we cannot overcome the cycle of dysfunction by our own emotions and will. We cannot will ourselves to do it. That's what's so great about the songs that we sang today because the power of the resurrection of Christ, as we read in that Lent passage, that we're united with Christ both in his death and his burial, but also his resurrection. And so while Alcoholics Anonymous and a lot of other things are really good, the ultimate answer to breaking the cycle is the transformation of the heart. So we have to admit we cannot overcome the cycle of dysfunction by our own emotions and will. Think about David with Bathsheba and all that happened. He committed adultery. He murdered Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite. Then the baby dies. And of course, Nathan the prophet comes to David and he says in 2 Samuel 12, you are the man. You're guilty. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to it as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Shameful to be killed by the Ammonites in that day. Think about that. But then David responds in Psalm 51. He says, against you and you only, Lord God, have I sinned. He owns, he takes responsibility for what he did. Thirdly, we must come to a place of surrender when we come to the end of ourselves. And have you ever been there where you're on the ground looking up? Or maybe you feel like life, you're in this deep, dark hole and all you can see is the sky. And you don't know how you're going to get out. And you wonder what you're going to do and that you're, you're at the end of yourself. Much like the prodigal son in Luke 15, verse 17. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? Here is a Jewish boy slopping pig food for pigs, thinking about eating that food. In verse 18, I will rise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. In verse 20, here's the key. He put action to his words and he arose and he came to his father. And there's where the repentance really began was when he decided to head back home. We must come to the place of surrender when we come to the end of ourselves. Fourthly, we find that victory comes when we let go and let God be God in our lives. In Mark 8, 34, Jesus said, in calling the crowd to him with his disciples, Jesus said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever lo loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? That's something that we need to Think about from time to time. What's most important in our life? Are we denying ourselves? Are we taking up the cross? Erwin Lutzer said in his book um, about we will not be silenced. He had a great quote, and I can't remember who it was. But he said, the problem with us as Christians is we keep wanting to exchange our crosses for a lighter one. We aren't willing to accept the cross that God puts upon us. Just like Jesus willingly accepted the cross that God put upon him. And number five, lastly, we must continually flood our mind and soul with the word of God to remind ourselves of how God views us in our past. See, that's the thing. Satan wants to keep bringing these things up, saying you're never going to change. This is what you grew up with. This is how you are. This is your personality. And this is the way you're going to be for the rest of your life. And we need to counteract that with the word of God and the good things that we can put into our life. In Psalm 77, 12, I will ponder all your work and meditate, meditate on your deeds. I wrote my thesis for one of my master's degree on meditation, 132 pages. But it all comes down to this. Meditation is just like the picture of a cow that has four stomachs. And when he eats grass, 
He chews it, and it goes into stomach number one. Then he burps it back up, kind of gross anyway. And then number two, he chews it again. He chews the cud, we, we say. And he goes through that process. We need to be meditating. We need to be chewing on God's word. In Psalm 119, verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts. Fix my eyes on your ways. So our key thought here as we close is we can break the sin that so easily besets us and become more than conquerors by the power of Christ. We can break the sin that so easily besets us and become more than conquerors by the power of Christ. In my class at Scott, I talk about African religions, and we talk about colonization. <clears throat> and there's a story about Cecil Rhodes, who came from Great Britain, and of course, Africa, which is now where Zimbabwe was, used to be called Rhodesia. After Cecil Rhodes, he came and claimed that land. And what he did was very amazing in history. He came, he saw all the resources, the gold, the diamonds, the coal, all the things he wanted to mine. So he went to the Africans, and using their own language, he used a technicality, and he basically stole the land for very little cost from the African people. Well, once they realized what had happened, they began to get up in arms, and they wanted to have a battle with Cecil Rhodes. The problem was they had primitive uh, warfare things to use, spears and things like that. But the British colonists came with rifles and wiped out many of the Africans. And of course, Cecil Rhodes, named Rhodesia after him, stole the land. Many people lost their lives. And uh, they lost everything because of his manipulation and his deception. What is your besetting sin to work on this week? Three questions to ponder as we close. What besetting sin is tripping you up and has become a habit in your life? Will you get alone with God and examine your heart about that? And will you make a plan to continually surrender the power of this sin to God in your life? It's important that we do that. And we do that through the gospel of Christ, knowing that Jesus came, took our sin upon himself, went to the cross, died, shed his blood, and then overcame the grave through the resurrection so that we have power over sin, over Satan, and over death itself in the hope of the gospel that will help us break the sin in our life. Let's bow for prayer. Father, as we come before you today, we thank you that you left all the warts and the ugly things of people's lives in your word. We know that men in ancient history often paid people to write biographies, and they always wanted to leave out the bad stories, but we're thankful, Lord, that you put them in there so that we could see we are just like Jacob. We're just like Laban in many ways. Whether big or small, whether people can see it or not, you know our hearts. So, Lord, whatever it is in our hearts and our lives that you're pointing out to, that your Holy Spirit is convicting us of this week, that's been a habitual sin and we've been unwilling to deal with it, or we'll say, God, we'll deal with something else, but I'm going to leave that one on the table. Help us to go after those big ones this week, to pick one out that's really been getting at us and taking control of our lives and surrender it to you this week. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand one more time this morning. We learned this song last week. Um, it's called Rock of Ages. So let's sing this together again as we uh, continue learning this song and as we continue in our worship this morning. Which flow be of sin? 
seated for just a few moments and again as we're about to leave the sanctuary make sure you have your mask and put it on if you would and then the uh, ushers will escort you out from back to front to keep our social distancing going on encourage you to have some fellowship talk with Donna and her granddaughter as well out in the lobby afterward and for those of you at home thank you for tuning in and joining us for the service and we encourage you as always to go to pleasantviewbett.com our website and look for the About Us tab and click on that, and the drop-down box will say, Take the Next Step. And I encourage you to fill out that card if you have any spiritual needs, if you need to have someone share with you about how you can become a believer in Christ, or if you have prayer requests. We just encourage you to fill that card out and hit Submit, and uh, we'll get it, and we'll add you to the prayer list or contact you with whatever spiritual need that you have. And we're grateful you took the time to join us today. Let's, uh, as we have been doing, let's look at our screens and uh, be reminded of, as we go out, of our vision statement, connect, grow, and serve. And repeat with me Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege, and it truly is a privilege, to gather in freedom to worship you. There's so many of our brothers and sisters around the world that would just uh, think it would be heaven to be able to have this opportunity to freely worship you without government intervention, without fear, without fear of, of Muslim people coming in and and killing them for their faith. And so, Lord, help us to not take for granted this privilege and this opportunity you've given us. And, Lord, as we go out, may we just be reminded that to whom you've given much is required, that as we go out we can share the joy and the fulfillment and happiness that we've experienced here with others who need to know of the love of Christ, who are hungry, who are lonely, who are searching, who are hopeless, and need the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Help us to be your ambassadors of goodwill by sharing the message this week as we go out. We pray and ask these things now in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.